Half a billion dollars are spent annually on corporate diversity programs, yet only 5% of CEOs in the Fortune 500 are women. And more than half a century since the Equal Pay Act, the wage gap still hovers at 80%. And as this topic comes more to the forefront, more discussions are being had on what we as a society are going to do about it. Well, sadly, even Google would have a hard time answering that one. But today's guest, a 15-year Google and Facebook veteran, is a first-hand witness to what it means to be a woman in the corporate world. And she now uses her experience to propel a new way of thinking and encourage women to value their well-being and to stop measuring their worth in money and position on the corporate ladder. Lecturing, teaching and conducting workshops all around the world to companies such as Google, American Express and Twitter, featured in Forbes, Thrive Global and Publishers Weekly to name a few, she empowers women to define career success on their own terms. And with her new book, Lean Out, The Truth About Women, Power and the Workplace, she's bringing an entirely new perspective on diversity and female leadership. So guys, please help me in welcoming the woman who is leaning out by providing a fresh voice for a new generation of thinkers. The woman who is leaning out and re-examining the business world's paradigm of what a successful leader actually means. And the woman who is leaning out so impactfully that it won't be long before the move becomes more popular than the Dougie. The self-proclaimed corporate rebel herself, Marissa Orr. I'm Lisa Bilyeu and I went from housewife to co-founder the billion dollar company Quest Nutrition and now president of Impact Theory. Our mission with this show is to empower you and all women to recognise you really can become the hero of your own life. Welcome to Women of Impact. Thanks so much for having me. Of course, welcome to the show my I'm dear. So excited to be here. Me too. And I think the, the best place for us to start is talking about the misconceptions you mm. feel and have seen in your career so far. Because I feel like if we attack that first, then we yeah. can talk about how we overcome them. So I've always been, since a very young age, very passionate about helping women and women's issues. In fact, it's always been something I've been really passionate about. So naturally, being at Google and Facebook over the years, they have all these female leadership programs and workshops and events, and I attended all of them. But after a while, I actually got pretty discouraged by them because I felt like instead of really listening to all the very valid concerns and challenges of the women in the room, we were essentially being lectured on how to behave more like men. I mean, they called it success behaviors, but really meant male behaviors. Right. And I couldn't think of anything less empowering and less feminist than holding up men as the benchmark or the norm to which we should aspire. So I started thinking about things more deeply and I've, I've really done so much research over the past 10 or 15 years. I'm kind of a researcher nerd. I did it for fun, but more about everything about human behavior and psychology. So as I was learning more about that and I was attending these workshops, sort of things started clicking and I thought, you know, we're really thinking about this the wrong way. And in that national conversation about the lack of CEOs in that world, it's really been dominated by a handful of uh, very powerful and elite women. So naturally, they're going to see the issues through a similar mm -hmm. perspective. But I think it's been limited because so many working women don't hear their voices, their concerns and challenges reflected in that conversation. So I wrote Lean Out to kind of represent that voice that I hadn't heard for myself, that I didn't connect to or identify with. I wrote it to represent that voice and to tell a totally different side of the story to, to women at work. And that's what I really love about it. So I'm always open to being changed. I love being changed and having one mindset um, alter and adapt to mm -hmm. um, improve my own life and improve the goals I'm trying to get to. And so what I love is that you are taking the norm of what has been taught out there mm -hmm. and you're actually saying, well, hang on, this is just one specific yeah. voice in the space. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> going to like, why do we have to act like men? Like, we shouldn't, mm -hmm. we should be women. I actually have a quote from you, which I thought was really powerful. With female dominant strengths, such as empathy and consensus building being the future of business, the headlines forecast that women will dominate the future generations of corporate leaders. But that won't happen until mm -hmm. we stop mistaking empathy for weakness and realize that female success shouldn't hinge on us being more like men. Yeah, so, like I said, as a research nerd, 
I've also read every business book out there and I've seen these themes repeat themselves over the years that I really believed in. I said, you know what, I actually am pretty empathetic and I have those sort of what we call softer skills in spades. And so I thought, you know, the corporate world is a zero sum competition for power. When you have a large organization structured is that competitive hierarchy, that's what it ends up being. And in those environments and contexts, it's behaviors like aggression, putting your needs ahead of others, self-aggrandizement, self-promotion. These are the behaviors that get you to the top. Those are the winning set mm -hmm. of behaviors. That's the game you're playing. And these are the exact opposite of things like cooperation and listening and empathy. So as long as our corporate structures are zero sum games, these empathetic and cooperative behaviors are always going to be a disadvantage in that structure. And why do you think it's hard for women? Because I heard you say basically, in fact, I have another quote of yours, which is great. <laughs> um, the first rule of being a woman at work is to never tell the truth about the reasonable feelings and concerns you have about being a woman at work. I always felt, and, I, and lots of women have reached out to me and said, thank you for saying that because I feel that way too, that we couldn't be honest about our ambivalence toward climbing the corporate ladder because that is always interpreted as a lack of ambition. When there was, there's a story I tell where I couldn't get a promotion at Google past the level where I was, the policy was you had to start managing more and more teams. Right. Well, I'm really, I'm, a cre I'm very creative. And when you manage people, you don't get to really dig into the work and build and solve problems and tell stories. So I knew that managing people would sort of decrease the, the motivation and meaning I had in my job. I also am a single mom of three kids. So I was managing so much at home and people at home. I didn't want to be responsible for more people in the office. And I knew I'd have more of an impact as an individual contributor being creative. And it was after learning sort of more about myself and that you know personality profile, I, I sort of learned, oh, well, I'm somebody that's motivated more by relationships and connection than I am by sort of positions of authority and control. So once I learned that, it was like an aha. I went to my manager and I said, you know, this is what motivates me. So if I'm a top performer, which at the time I had the highest scores on the team, if you want to keep me motivated and engaged and making an impact, you should offer me something I actually want because the management position is more of a punishment than a reward. And I thought, oh, now she'll give me the promotion because she'll understand, oh, it's just a personality difference. Of course we want to motivate Marissa. And she was very nice about it, but she was like, the policy is what it is. And over time, I realized something that I could never find in a business book or research study, which was they were never gonna exempt me from that policy and give me the promotion because mm -hmm. that policy in a way was designed to weed people like me out. What I oh, saw as a difference in personality and motivation, others saw as weakness. Mm -hmm. And that to my core really bothered me because, you know, like I said, we tout these things, these sort of cooperative traits, a lot of the things that come along with my personality type as the things we need for the future of business, we're in a knowledge economy, all this stuff, but we don't value them because, like I said, we see them as weakness. God, there's so much good yeah. stuff there, I don't want to interrupt you, but I was like, I've got to keep a mental note of all the things you said. Okay, so you go to your boss, how do you become so self-aware, first of all, because like you said, right now it is like, oh, well, of course you want to work your way up the ladder. The whole point is to get mm -hmm. to the top. Why climb the ladder if otherwise? Right. And so here it is an opportunity to get further ahead. And you stopped and actually did a self-aware, a self-test on yourself mm -hmm. to say, do I actually want this? How did you do that? And then the follow-up question is, how did you empower yourself to say that out loud in a corpor corporation yeah. that doesn't pat you on the back for it. I think I've always been fascinated by psychology as using a study of myself as mm -hmm. such a prime, you know, candidate to understand this stuff. So I think my fascination with that topic and human behavior has helped because it helps me understand myself. Now, 
It didn't come automatically to me, though, in understanding that I didn't want that promotion. I was actually fighting quite hard for it at first. Okay, so yeah, take yeah. us through that. And I think I was just going along with what I was supposed to want without really stopping to think about it. I'd worked really hard for Google. I mean, I felt I gave them so much of me. You know, why weren't they sort of recognizing that and rewarding it? I felt a little resentful. So I think with the promotion is when I realized, like, I was so angry. And then I was like, well, how do I get rid of this anger? And I thought about it. I'm like, well, had I gotten that promotion, I would have had to do X, Y, and Z. And I thought, oh, I would have been miserable. And then all of a sudden it hit me. I'm like, how am I fi- why am I fighting and working so hard for something I don't even want? I, w- I just never thought about it. I thought I was just supposed to want that because everybody else was going why? for it. And like I said, there is that view in that world that if you're not going for it, it means you lack ambition. And, you know, so you don't think about it. You think this is what ambition means. I don't want to be told that because I don't want that position that I lack ambition. Ambition is just a goal, right? You can have ambition to be the best mother. You can have ambition in your fitness goals. Like, Ambition is a large, outsized, big goal and vision. It's not synonymous with being a CEO. And that was really what I was trying to point out with this whole book, actually, is that there's a different way to look at it. We've just looked at it through such a narrow lens. And there's a quote um, that I love by Austin Kleon. He wrote, all advice is autobiographical. (laughs) And I, I love that. You know, it's, it's, not always true, but a lot of times when you're reading somebody's thoughts on an issue, it's through the lens of their life story. And I feel like that's what's happening with women at work. We're telling one side of the story through that narrow lens and we don't hear other perspectives. Yeah, it was so enlightening to me when I started reading your book because I had definitely, and I am that person that wants to reach the top of the corporate Mm -hmm. ladder, like for sure. And I was always actually very sensitive to making sure that other women who decide to not um, go into the business Mm -hmm. world, that they didn't feel bad about it because they shouldn't, like every woman should do Mm -hmm. what they dream and desire. And then the same for women who decide to stay at home. Mm -hmm. But it never occurred to me to think about the women that want to be in the corporate world but don't want to be at the top. Yeah. It didn't dawn on me. Right. It wasn't that I was trying to like ignore them. It didn't even dawn on me because I don't feel like that. So when I was reading your book, I was like, wow, A, thank you. And then B, I now feel like I can grow by understanding yeah. other women and not thinking, because I'm always thinking, oh, you want to be at the top as well. Mm-hmm. And it never dawned on me that that, Me saying that to someone could actually be detrimental to them. Yeah. I'm so happy to hear you say that because people have said to me, oh, it's it's very um, provocative or antagonistic or whatever. I never have ever seen it that way. Mm. I don't even think my perspective is controversial. Everyone's like, oh, this is a big topic. Are you afraid of the controversy? To me, it's always been there's women could be whichever, wherever they fall, Mm -hmm. right? And this book was never, we have to be one way or the other, or one way is bad and one way is good. That's the whole problem, is that value judgment, right? The problem is, from my perspective, is we weren't valuing everybody, mm. right? And so the whole reason I wrote the, this book is for people that don't have that perspective to see it from a new point of view, right? My manager, when I couldn't get promoted, I didn't think she was a bad person or sought, like I, I wasn't angry with her. I was more angry that people didn't understand this and take it seriously mm-hmm. and take me seriously and my impact uh, because it didn't look like theirs. Yeah, it really didn't. Well, thank you for saying that as well. And I really want to talk about that on impact because that's now become a big buzzword. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's kind of like, well, if, you know, if you're creating impact, then you must be doing something great. And mm-hmm. if you're not creating impact, then you're not. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you then overcome that? So in the company, um, it's great to hear that your realization of your management position came from not being offered it in the first yeah. place. I love that story. That's great. Um, so then when you get offered it, and um, you turn it down. Were you worried about the, um, the repercussions and what that meant about other people in that world and how they saw you? 
Yeah, I have a lot of traits, behaviors, characteristics that fit with the female stereotype. So I'm nurturing, communal, warm, compassionate kind of person. And over time I realized in the corporate world that that meant people didn't take me as seriously. And that I wasn't, I was well liked at work, but I wasn't as well respected as I felt I should have been given the Mm. quality of my work. And I started to see these connections, right? Like Sheryl Sandberg and Lean In, it talks a lot about, you know, when women who are more alpha that fall outside of this stereotype, when they rise, they're less likable. And I thought, well, the side of that story we don't tell is the more likable a woman is, the less she's respected Mm -hmm. and taken seriously. There's a trade-off for both. And actually likability in the corporate world is not, it's not only not important to getting promoted, it's a liability. So there's all these, this research that shows Mm. that the more agreeable you are, which is one of the big five uh, dimensions of personality, the less likely you are to rise um, Mm. on the corporate ladder. It doesn't mean that you're less competent to be in those positions but you have less of the traits that we use as proxies for competence. For example, in you know, the corporate world, in an information economy, almost everything we do is invisible, right? our output. Mm. So we use our creativity, our imagination, our intellect. We build strategies, marketing plans. These are all things like you can't see the output, so it makes it incredibly difficult in a large, large organization to know who's doing a good job. Mm-hmm. Like, I sometimes hard to even know who's doing any work at all, right? right? <laughs> yeah. So we end up using, we end up grading people on their visibility over instead of their competence. Mm-hmm. We look at things like who talks the loudest and the most, who does the most self promotion, who works on the most visible projects. These are all the things that we mistake as competence and performance, and these behaviors like empathy and listening, et cetera, these correlate with agree- agreeableness, mm-hmm. which is another. And that's, these are behaviors that are less uh, visible. They're harder to see and detect. So we end up ignoring them, mm-hmm. essentially. So this whole concept of it's hard to know is doing a good job, it just gets out of control and we rely even more on the visible behaviors. These visible behaviors correlate more highly with men they don't correlate more highly with competence. So it's really a system that rewards male dominant traits, um, even though they don't necessarily correlate with leadership skills. It's also different when you're talking about a business that grows into a large organization. Mm -hmm. It's a very different dynamic than climbing your way through that or a large established organization from the bottom to the top. Because when you've built the company yourself, you're not playing a power game Mm -mm. to get to the top. You're already at the top. You're building, you know, and organizing. That's a totally different thing. And I say that in the beginning of the book. What I talk about is really specific to these large organizations because they're essentially, you know, these zero-sum games. And because of that, the winners will always look the same. They'll be the ones more motivated by those positions and have these sets of behaviors that get you to the top. I know I went off on a tangent. No, no, that was great. And like my next question is then how do we as a society or women who want to be part of these big companies, um, they're really excited, they get a job, they want to work their way up, they're Mm -hmm. not interested though in bringing on the male um, dominated um, habits um, or traits. what are the steps that someone right, do can do? do then? Yeah, what do we do? So I devote a whole chapter to this in the book. The chapter before it, I talk about the things companies can do. Right. Um, and then I follow it up with individuals because a couple reasons. One is it's really hard to change established power structures, like really hard. And number two, you know, it's up to us as individuals. Right now, we measure female progress in this country on just two things, money and position on the ladder, as you said in the introduction. These are really narrow dimensions. 
And what it signals to women is that these are the most important things to have an equal society. So lean out. A lot of people mistake that to mean like quit your job or stop caring. Right. That's not what it means <laughs> right. at all. It simply means leaning out of anyone else's story for who you should be and what your career should look like. It's about defining success on your own terms and owning that regardless of what people are going to judge you for. So I think it starts with really doing the internal work to figure out who you are, what your needs are, you know, what value do you bring to the table and what are your emotional needs? So for example, I realized over time I really needed creativity in my work to make me happy and be meaningful. Once I realized that, and I also realized I wasn't getting that at work, mm. it was really up to me to figure out how to fill that gap. So to, the recognition... Did you naturally take that ownership immediately? Or did you first put it on the company and then realize this ain't going to work yeah. and then you took ownership? I think it didn't happen in this linear way like that. Mm. I think... I w Facebook was a very dark time of my life and it was one of those times where you're at your bottom and you kind of have to... I didn't know who I was anymore. My identity mm. was completely unraveled and I asked myself like, who am I? What do I want? What do I need? And I started... I felt powerless. I was bullied by a very powerful executive at the company. It was not Cheryl Sandberg, just to clarify, but mm. it was a dark time and I felt powerless. And I started waking up early in the morning to work on a book, this book, to just get some control back over my life. And once I started doing that, I think it was then I realized, like, wow, I, you'd think it sounds terrible. I was waking up 4.30 in the morning just to get an hour in before the kids got up and I had to go to my job. Like, it sounds, oh, how could you do that? But the truth was, I never felt more empowered. Mm. I was taking things into my own hands and I realized I can't depend on any institution or anyone to fulfill my needs. I have to do this myself. So I think it wasn't like a realization and then I did it. It was more of like I was grasping. I needed a way to feel in control. And that after sort of doing it, I realized, oh, okay, I see the connection now. I wasn't getting what I needed. And as soon as I took ownership for it, I felt powerful. So... I think it's a lot about doing that inner work, which is hard. I still do it every day. It's a journey to really figure out who you are and what you need. But a big part of it and what I try and say in this book is that our institutions in that world are not designed to fulfill a lot of our needs. Mm -hmm. And so when you figure out what the, your needs are and what your organization can and can't offer, it's a great starting point because then you have to fill in the gaps. You have to figure out a way to meet your own emotional needs. So that to me is the essence of empowerment, right? Is that you're taking ownership and control for fulfilling your own needs and desires. So lean out doesn't mean quit your job. If you're unhappy, it's really just leaning out of anyone else's story, defining success on your own terms and, you know, just taking ownership of what you need and want. And I think well-being is a much better way to measure that for yourself than winning, which is what a lot of us um, are doing now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that you say, like, you just need to be honest with the yeah. corporation that you're working for and seeing how it actually serves you or not. Yeah, well, I think the first step is we have to be honest with ourselves. Mm. And that's hard too because sometimes we don't even know what the honest truth is because we've been listening to everybody else for so long tell us what to do who to be you know like i wanted to study english but my parents they encouraged me to study business and so i did so it took me a while to sort of like undo all of that and figure out who i was Mm. It's so crazy that you, as you were saying, like your parents kind of, you know, like yeah. you just followed your parents' um, advice and how different generations have changed mm -hmm. in that once upon a time it really was, well, if you're a woman, you're going to stay at home and, you mm -hmm. know, have a kid and be married and that's going to be it. And now it's kind of transitioned into this. And now there's almost this new expectation mm -hmm. of what a woman, woman's looking like. And 
now there's a new mold that people are trying to fit into mm -hmm. but like you're saying there's the expectation is just not realistic for everyone to fit into that same mold yeah so i sympathize with my parents position right like they want the best for me mm. and they were scared like when i told them i was writing a book and i was not going back to the corporate world we did not talk about my book and my family for like a year because it it seemed crazy right like i was like I said, I'm a single mom of three. I had a lucrative career at two of the best tech companies in the world. And I'm like, I'm going to go write a book instead, something I have no experience doing. I have no contacts in publishing. Nobody gets, you know, it's so hard to get book deals. It did sound insane. Mm -hmm. But I think that's why we impose these things on our kids and on ourselves, because we're afraid. I think our, our decisions are fear-based, right? And they wanted me to study business. I'm not a business person. I faked, I did it for 15 years. I figured it out, but it was never me. So it's scary to sort of be true to yourself. And so what did that final ownership look like when you said it out loud? Because I want to give like people yeah, at home some tips right like yeah. on, like if they feel what you're saying right now is resonating with them oh my god yeah. i feel exactly the same way thank god someone's finally talking mm -hmm. you know my language mm -hmm. i want to tell people too and like what mm -hmm. is that step because you've got the fear you've got the judgment mm -hmm. um you're worried about losing your job about people thinking that you're less what does that actually look like how do you bring yourself to do yeah. that and then own it like you said well at Facebook, there was a point, I, it was, again, so terrible. I, I kind of thought, you know, I, I am going to get fired eventually. It's just that bad. Mm. So I started working on this book. And every weekend, I'd go through like a spreadsheet of my budget. And I would say, OK, I'm going to quit in four weeks so I can dedicate myself to the book. And four weeks would come around. I didn't have the nerve. OK, I'll wait till I get this bonus, you know, that came around didn't have the nerve. Now, I was almost done with my book proposal, which I had spent months on. And like, while I was at that job, I was too afraid to quit. Why were you afraid? Money, honestly. Really? Pure yeah, finances. it was purely money. It felt totally irresponsible. What kind of mother who's, you know, making this nice life for herself and her kids leaves that to do follow this, cr what seemed like such a crazy idea and a crazy dream. And I believed in the book. I believed in myself, but I was scared to death. It felt irresponsible. From the outside, I could see how easily insane it was. It was so unlikely that this plan would happen in the way that I imagined it. I'm not a risk taker. I mean, clearly I am now. It's yeah, like I did it. I don't know. But then I was fired. And I was totally blindsided. In a way, I was blindsided mm -hmm. because it happened on the way home from work on a random day driving home. I wasn't expecting it in the moment. And just like sort of in an abstract way, I thought probably it's coming. But I'm such a conscientious hard worker, that didn't fit with my identity. Mm -hmm. And so in a way, I was blindsided. And I cried. I, I was just like, oh my God, it happened. And I was 99% done with the book proposal. I finished my drive home. I cried probably for 20 minutes. Like I had this amazing cry. And then I thought, this is the universe giving me a kick in the butt that I needed. Like, thank God this happened. I don't know if I would have ever had the courage to do it quit. And so I think it was the attitude after I was fired hmm. that helped me. First of all, I had shown myself that I'm taking myself seriously enough that I'd worked for four or five months on this book proposal, which is a lot of hard work. So I think that gave me a big shot of confidence. I thought, you know, this book is in me. Clearly, I'm taking this seriously. I wake up every morning now, 4.30. I'm like the laziest kind of normally like undisciplined person. But here I am rewiring my whole personality to be disciplined and take this seriously, take myself seriously. Um, and so, yeah, I, don't, I didn't have the courage to quit, but I did have the courage to keep going. I could have easily mm -hmm. gone back to Google, but I didn't. So I guess, you know, to give myself a little credit, I think that took a lot of courage. A lot of courage. Um, as far as, you know, tips for other people, one is, for me, it's all about gaining perspective. 
right? You can really kind of drown in the, the myopia or the details, right? And it's so hard sometimes to pull yourself out. So one thing that I have found so useful is I imagine myself at 80 years old, right? And, and let me tell you first the genesis of, of how this um, tip was born. My older son used to be scared shitless of ET. This was years ago, um, but he had this idea that if he went into my bathroom, ET would be in the bathtub in my bathroom. The problem is it's the only bathtub in the house and he had to get in it. So we would battle, you know? And one day I just yelled, I'm like, E.T. is not real. How could you be afraid of something that's not even real? And then all of a sudden it hit me. I was like, look what I'm afraid of. I'm afraid of writing and posting it online because I'm afraid of what people think of me. I'm afraid of losing my identity if I quit Facebook. All these things aren't real. There's no difference between my son being afraid of E.T. The only difference is I have perspective. I've lived long enough to know that that ET isn't real and that ET isn't going to be in his bathtub. The only difference between us was scale, right? Scale of perspective. I knew his fear wasn't real because I was older, I had experience, and I had wider perspective. So all of a sudden I thought, wow, I wonder, like when I'm 80, will I look at myself mm -hmm. and think, what an idiot that you were so afraid to write something. Like, at 80, what, what would I want to slap myself across the face about? So I, I talked to that person, you know? And when I talk to this imagine myself at 80, all of a sudden things become more clear, like what matters and what doesn't. So that's the one, uh, that's the one that tip one. and trick. I talk to my 80-year-old all the time when I'm like nervous or anxious or I can't decide which way to go or, you know, it just, it brings clarity. Yeah. Um, what other tips? Because at the end, you give like six or seven great ones. For me, a lot of what helped me was really sort of understanding myself through the framework of like these personality dimensions, right? Because once I started to understand there's like very distinct needs and um, sort of motivations of each personality type or on each of these five dimensions, he really helped me understand what I did need. So I score off the charts for agreeableness. That means I'm not really going to succeed in a context that's a zero sum game because my happiness in, comes from relationships and collaboration and win-win scenarios. Like I just, it snapped into perspective for me once I read about that. If I were still in the corporate world, still, gives me power to know that because I can say, all right, well, a management position is not going to make me happy because it can, it's, it's in tension with developing long-term you know, relationships. If you have to exert authority over somebody, sometimes your relationship suffers. But if you're mm -hmm. managing somebody and you act like their best friend, your authority suffers, right? It's a balance. So in a context where that's the reward, authority, I'm not going to be, you know, happy. So mm -hmm. that's um, one way to do it. You look through these needs. Another one is um, sort of power to have sort of authority over people. That's a big need for a certain personality type. So, you know, maybe the corporate world would be a great place because it does offer that as a reward. So just understanding what human needs are, which mm -hmm. ones exist, and where you land on that continuum. It's almost like a compass for your well-being, which is, okay, these are the things, this is where I'm really needy, this is where I'm, you know, not needy at all, it's not important. And then you can start to figure out how is my job meeting or not meeting, you know, these five needs and where I am on that continuum. And then from there, it gives you like a roadmap almost to figure out, you know, what is my personal well-being look like. I love that. Um, and you talk very strongly about trust as well, and yeah. I really love this. Talk yeah. to me a little bit about yeah. that and why you think that is important in not even just, I mean, the corporate world, but kind of, well, really anywhere in the corporate world, no matter where you are, I think it's yeah. just as important. Yeah, this is a big one. I, I kind of see personality psychology in much simpler terms than a lot of people because there's really two dimensions on which we sort of form our opinions about other people and sort of how they form about us. And they're, how much do I respect this person and how much do I trust them? Mm. And the best leaders 
have a balance of I respect and trust them. Mm -hmm. And the best way to explain it is they answer two questions for you. Can they get shit done? And will trust, will I be happy with the result? Mm -hmm. Can this person impose their will and agenda on the world? And do they care about my needs and how those fit in, right? Mm -hmm. So the best leaders sort of exert, uh, exude both. It's very hard to do. Um, and I keep saying zero-sum game, trust is the first casualty because if putting my needs ahead of yours, right, in a win-lose game is going to make me win, all of a sudden trust goes out the window for everybody. And that's really what characterizes so much, of, so much about these large organizations. There's just no trust. They're ruled by fear. And, you know, it really compromises well-being, it compromises um, productivity, right? People are just all of a sudden fearful, so they're out for themselves. So um, I talk a lot about the antidote or the solution for diversity really being about building these environments of trust so that people can be themselves because people are diverse by their very nature. We're all different, mm -hmm. right? The only reason that's not reflected at the top of the corporate world because only this subset of personality mm -hmm. traits are rewarded and recognized. So the winners will always look the same. But true diversity is if you can build sort of an environment and a structure that people can trust not to be arbitrary and punitive, mm. but to protect them and be objective, then people are themselves. And the diversity will be, you know, just as varied as it is in human nature. Yeah, you laid out like six different versions of trust and like it really hit me because I was like, well, it's just trust. Like right. you either trust someone or you don't. But I love how you break them down and how each one of them feels so important as a woman in the corporate world to mm -hmm. um, help succeed, I guess. Can you break those down for me? Yeah, so there's different dimensions um, to trust. And the study I talk about with psychological safety, that was done by Google. And the results very clearly showed that there were five things that underpinned the best teams. And only one of them was absolutely necessary. So in other words, the other four, there were no priority to them, right? But number one was psychological safety. If that, what, that was like the fundamental prerequisite requirement backdrop, if there was none, a team could not be effective. And that's another way of saying trust. People trust that they essentially could be themselves and that you know, they feel safe being vulnerable. Like they could tell the truth, right? How many people can say they feel totally okay telling the truth in their job in the corporate world? Like it's so rare to feel like you can be honest. And yet that's the number one requirement to have an effective team. So it's really fascinating. And psychological safety is really all about, I can be myself, I can be vulnerable, I could take risks in the interest of the business mm -hmm. without being punished for it. And it's not, you have to make everyone trustworthy. That's not really the point and it's impossible. It means you have to build systems that people can trust and they tr can trust those systems to protect them and be fair mm. versus, okay. yeah, so that they feel comfortable being themselves. Because I know I couldn't be myself a lot at work because I, I it compromised rewards or you know it's sort of i i never knew what game i was playing i was very naive but that's actually because you actually say in your book yeah. know what game you're playing yeah. and whether you like it or not um i think it only serves you to actually look <clears throat> at it and acknowledge it and then figure out what game it is and then just say do i want to play yes that's exactly it and i say this point blank in the book i actually didn't care what game I was playing. I wanted to know what it was and I wanted everyone to be honest mm. about it because I felt deceived or I felt fooled. And, you know, like goes back to me saying maybe I was a little naive, but in my career, I just figured well, everybody works in the interest of the business and we're all like here to do a good job and our teammates, we're teammates. So we work together and 
then like certain things would happen. People would get thrown under the bus. I would get thrown under the bus mm. for no reason. And then decisions were made that to me made no sense. So rationally, this isn't good for the business. And then slowly over years, I'm like, oh, because this is not even about the business. Like the difference between mm. advice from entrepreneurs and all those business books is that in the corporate world, like that advice doesn't translate because you still get a salary whether or not you're doing a good job or mm. not. And you can get promoted and succeed without really ever doing anything to help the business. And in fact, sometimes doing things that hurt the business are good for your career because nobody can tell anyway, mm. right? Your, your impact and where you sit, there's so much room there that you can really do whatever you want. No one really knows if it's impacting the business or not. When you have a smaller operation, you're closer to that bottom line, right? I remember when I started Google, it was very small. And like 50 people or something, It was right? 50 people in the New York office when right. I started. Now there's over 8,000. And it was a totally different place. Like mm. when we were smaller, um, it was just, there was so much work to do. Everyone was focused on doing that work. And then as it grew and people became so far removed from the everyday sort of impact and the skills required to start a business, grow it. it it's not at all the same environment, right? Mm -hmm. Like when you get that paycheck every two weeks in a big corporation and you're, you don't have that drive or hunger because it doesn't matter anyway, that operates under a whole different set of laws. Didn't you say something like 87% of people or something aren't productive at work and when they're big corporations, you just don't know because... Yeah. Because people don't realize it's not like in the industrial age. Well, let's take like a car manufacturer, mm -hmm. right? Henry Ford was obsessed with like productivity, right? Mm -hmm. and, and the assembly line, all that stuff. But today output is mostly, again, in the form of knowledge and intellect, things you can't see. But here's the other big point. Henry Ford used to own 80% of his own supply. But today, the supply is owned by the employees because it's in their brains. Hmm. Like Google hires well, engineers for way. their brain power, right? Yeah. They're not hiring, pe like the, they're spending billions of dollars on brain power. That means the employees own the supply today at a company like Google, Facebook, Uber, all these, so many companies. Mm. And the psychology of motivation is very clear. When you don't feel per like your company cares or that your well-being is respected, and so many people feel disrespected and borderline humiliated and totally unappreciated, it's the first thing you do. You check out mentally, right? Mm -hmm. That's the equivalent of Henry Ford going up to his supply. I'm like making up the imaginary scenario, but going to one of his warehouses and setting it on fire. Like, who cares? Right? That's really strong though. Yeah. That really hit me as you were saying it. Yeah, right? Like then a factory worker, if they were unhappy and left, who cares? They can replace it with another warm body. Things were mechanical. Huh. Now the supply leaves with the employee. I really like that analogy. Yeah. And we don't think about it that right. way. And say so we don't pay enough attention to we it. We don't because we think it doesn't really matter. Mm -mm -mm. And, and I also think when you're the CEO, with, let's say, you know, you're the type of person that, you know, you're good at playing that power game. And again, nothing wrong with it. No judgment. I'm just saying, sure. matter of fact, mm -hmm. people of that nature are not great at putting other people's needs, understanding them and considering them. And what's at the heart of well-being is meeting other people's needs. So there's like a fundamental like thing that doesn't connect there, which is, the CEO at the top, real powerful, you respect them, but do you trust them? And can they, are they good at understanding what people really need and then making that a priority? It like doesn't fit. Mm. So I think there's so many issues and I think what I'm trying to do is just be honest about all of them because there's just, there's, there's a lot there to unpack. Yeah, and yeah. I think that that's where it starts, right? With opening up the discussion, yeah. being honest about what it's like for you as an individual, mm -hmm. and then 
starting the talk because yeah. like you said there are a lot of women who haven't felt like this voice has been spoken yet mm -hmm. and so i think that there you've even said this there's space for everybody space but for we everyone. just need to open and allow the space for yeah. everyone to be able to have that voice and i think one thing for that i really hope um, for with this book and women have started to tell me which is the best thing i could hear is that i'm gi giving them a language to help them understand this. Like, oh, I've always sort of felt these things, but I didn't know how to express right. them or the language, or I didn't know that other women felt that way. And that's really what I'm trying to do is like, no, your power just looks different, like mine did, and here's how I found it, and hopefully that will help you find yours. Well, speaking of power, what is your superpower? I think, Honesty and truth is very, comes very naturally to me. Um, I just, it puts me in trouble sometimes too, but I also think connection. Like I, I have a small circle, like a handful of friends, people in my life, but like those are everything to me. And I just, I think my superpower is really connecting because I care so much about people and my connections. I'm, I, I'm a really good like listener and so people feel connected to me because of that because I actually care. That's awesome. Mm. And where can people <laughs> find you and the book and everything yeah. that you're doing? So the book's on Amazon now. It came out last week. It's in Barnes & Noble. I just saw it in an airport um, online. You can find me on Twitter, Marissa Beth Orr. You can read the pro and Instagram, Marissa Beth Orr. You can read the prologue of the book on my Medium page, um, which is just at Marissa Orr. And I hope to hear from people because uh, I love the conversation. Awesome. Well, guys, 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 the conversation that she's having is incredible. So please do pick up the book, um, chime in, be part of this conversation. There isn't just one voice. There isn't just one way to view things. And that's what I so love about her and what she's talking about. Um, every single woman is different. So our opinions and our views are always also going to be different. So hopefully her book resonates with you. Go check it out. If you're not following me, follow me at Lisa Billu. And if you're not subscribed, Click that subscribe button down there. And until next time, guys, be the hero of your own life. Peace out. Thank you. What up, guys? Lisa here. Thanks so much for watching this episode. And if you haven't already subscribed, click that little bell right in front of you. Click, click, click away. We release episodes every Wednesday, so be sure to get notified. Till next time, go be the hero of your own life.